All right, so before we begin, I want to share some logistical notes. This program will run for one and a half hours and will end no later than around 7.30 um, Pacific time. I'm gonna be sharing in the chat, actually just shared a document that contains specific access information. I wanna let you know that we really encourage participants to um, move around and take the time and space that you need. This could be a heavy topic. Um, so whether you are going to be following along with the activities that our artists are um, doing or contributing questions or feedback to the performers, you will be able to do so and we really encourage you to do so. There will be some limited text tran um, transcriptions of provided for some of the performers. Unfortunately, we don't have um, translation for everything, but we will be releasing this program as a recording on YouTube later with captions. So you'll be able to share that with everyone as well. Um, we also are asking performers to share some content notice for potentially difficult or triggering topics. So um, again, if you need to, you can exit or enter this digital space as needed. Please feel free, welcome to do so. Um, also stand up and stretch, drink water, take the breaks that you need. The document that we shared also has resources for those dealing with mental health crisis or those seeking longer term support. Um, and you can chat me directly, Joy Yamaguchi, um, with any specific questions or concerns. And I will share the um, link again for those who joined in new. Thank you. And finally, while the museum is closed to the public, we are still available online and we're hosting lots of digital programs like this one. Um, it's, we're calling it our Janum at Home initiative. Our, our physical doors are closed, but we really still want to share and connect with this community. So you can check out our website at janum.org. I'll also be sharing that in the chat. Um, we have a poetry reading tomorrow featuring some amazing poets as part of our Nikkei Uncovered series as part of Discover Nikkei. We have an exhibition talk with our curator Clement Hanami on Saturday and an educator's open house with lots of resources um, next Tuesday. So if you like what you see today also, please consider donating to Janum or becoming a member. Um, those resources will also be in the document that I shared. And then please also support everyone that you see today. They're all really amazing people doing amazing work. And so please reach out, give them your likes and follows and um, donations. So there will also be an optional feedback survey at the end of this program. Please fill that out. It really helps us provide content like this and make it better and better every time. Um, and now I want to uh, invite our partners in Changing Tides um, to come in. So Cortland and Rain, if you would like to join. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Only everyone. Um, okay. My name is Cortland. I am from Changing Tides. Um, first of all, thank you, Janum, for letting us be a part of this amazing program. Um, we did a program a couple weeks ago, and it was also really awesome. So thank you to Janum for continuing to do great programming. Um, a little bit about Changing Tides. We're a program of Little Tokyo Service Center. Um, we started in 2018 as an initiative that wanted to address the mental health stigma within the Japanese and Asian American communities. Um, and since then, we've really evolved into a program of LTSC. And our mission now is to normalize positive mental health within our community through events, outreach and education, and open conversations such as these. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about what we do, please visit us at thechangingtides.org. Um, it's also going to be in the resources um, that Joy had shared. Um, and if you take a look at our blog on our website, we have recent updates about what we've been doing during these times. And we also have a blog up right now called Spring Currents. Um, and this is where we're keeping all of our playlists or art tutorials or workout videos and just general resources that we've collected and found helpful during this time. Um, so that'll also be in the resources that Joy has shared in the chat. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Ray Nakamura, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Changing Tides. So as Cortland mentioned, we are a program of the Little Tokyo Service Center, and participating in programs such as this is just one of the ways that we're really working to meet the changing needs of the community during this time. And other ongoing efforts that we've had include providing food and hot meals to the most vulnerable populations, as well as helping small businesses navigate these tricky times and helping seniors fight social isolation um, during these times. So if you're interested in learning more about how you can donate, support, or volunteer, feel free to visit us at ltsc.org. And before we continue with the program, we just wanted to take a moment for you to kind of 
sit back, reflect on your mental, emotional, and physical state. I think with this pandemic, for some of us, it might have brought upon a lot more work and things might have kind of sped up, while for others, things may have slowed down and times may look different. Um, but either way, whatever situation you're coming from, uh, whatever, however you're coming into this event tonight, um, let's just take a minute or two to either draw, write, or simply think about how you're doing right now. So I'll give you guys a moment for that. All right, thank you everyone for taking a moment just to pause and kind of process before we head into everything. So now I'll pass it back off to Joy so we can get the program started. Thank you so much to Changing Tides. And again, we shared that resource in the chat. So please check it out, thechangingtides.org. We're gonna start today with a team from the Things I Never Said documentary. It's a film that's going to be coming out that follows the life of four Asian American young adults and their mental health journeys, focusing on the intergenerational sociocultural differences contributing to the stigmatization and lack of education on mental health in Asian American communities. We're going to be joined by Wendy, Beatrice, and Sam from the production team. So if I can invite them all to join now. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Sam. I am one of the producers on the Things I Never Said documentary. Uh, and I'm uh, one of the other producers. Yeah. Uh, I'm Wendy. I'm the director of the documentary. And uh, yeah, so Things I Never Said, it's a documentary that we've been working on for a little bit over a year now at this point. Um, it started when um, I mean, growing up, you know, like we all have different kind of pressure and, you know, from being Asian Americans and just, you know, mental health in general. And it really started when this project really started when I was talking to this girl I was growing up with and she was just entering college at a time and she was facing a lot of um, anxiety, a lot of depressive symptoms and I encourage her to, you know, start, uh, seek out counseling from her school. And she came back to me. She said, actually, you know, the therapist told me that I show a lot of borderline personality disorder symptoms. And I had no idea what that even is. So I looked it up and I was, and when, as I was going through it, I was like, oh, this is like, I didn't realize these are like, diagnosable symptoms. I thought that just what it meant to be like Asian American growing up. So it really started the, um, made me think about it. Like the reason, like a lot of people growing up has similar uh, experiences and symptoms. So why, why don't we know this was an issue? It's because we really um, don't, you know, we really don't start talking about these things enough. And, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a therapist, I'm not in STEM, but what can I do to, um, to help um, start the conversation? And, but what I, what I am is I'm a filmmaker. So that's when I thought maybe I'll film, you know, people talking about these things so that when people are watching these, they know that this, you know, they can identify kind of like how I identify, like, oh, look, like I have those feelings too. You know, I have this experience too. Maybe I can um, talk to someone about it. So that's kind of how this project got started. So like you had this idea, you had this story that you wanted to tell. Um, often we know in filmmaking, for those of you who are not filmmaking, it can be really hard to get off the ground. 
be really hard to pull a team together to inspire and to walk through it. And I really just want to hear about that process, Wendy. And like, because you had the story that you wanted to tell, so how did you go about doing so? Yeah, so um, actually the first person I met was, uh, was Beatrice and um, a mutual friend introduced us and when I met her at a, at a restaurant and she's this like, young girl who's like so passionate about this, this topic. And um, we, we got together and she really wanted to, um, she really wanted to support, support it and produce it. Um, we, um, we talked about, you know, like w which direction do we even go with this um, idea? And um, like, will people in the community even be interested in watching something like this? So we started talking to people around us, talking to different community leaders um, from, you know, different uh, nonprofits. And the response we got and support we got, honestly, was very, very overwhelming and um, confirming. So that is, like, we didn't even have to do, like, a call to be like, who is willing to share stories? A lot of people reached out. I want to talk about, you know, share their stories and really get the conversation started. And after that, there's a lot of, there, we also, you know, talk to a lot of like researchers because we want to make sure we represent this topic as well-rounded as possible. So, and as we learn more about this topic, the more this story kind of snowballed. And uh, we learned about different ways of like doing surveys um, to even showcase, you know, the mental health in Asian culture, the modern minority myth, you know, a lot of issues that we weren't even aware that contribute to like this symptoms we have today. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, a little bit of how that happened. Uh, Beatrice, um, Wendy said that you were like really passionate about the subject. And I just wanted to hear more about your perspective. Um, here's someone you just met uh, approaching you about a project that is, uh, was quite large, is quite large. And I just wanted to hear more about what your thoughts were when you walked into this. Yeah, I think the timing was really well um, because I had just graduated from film school after studying uh, film producing and um, kind of like what Wendy said, like these problems all existed, but it felt just like existing as a human, not um, necessarily, or like it just wasn't part of um, discourse and family or um, friends and things like that. Well, it was more so with friends, but um, I think the timing was really well when she talked to me about wanting to start this project um, and to capture like the reality of people's lives because we want this project to be very visceral and to be able to step into people's shoes and um, see some similarities and differences um, within these people and just start the conversation about mental health because it's such a great topic. It's not black and white. It's something to be discussed and to share and like um, through sharing you heal from that and it doesn't it's not it doesn't stop it's an ongoing journey and part of who we are and it's not a weakness it's just something that needs to be taught I mean not um, talked about <laughs> and um, embraced more so that's how I feel <laughs> what are some of the hardest things you guys dealt with um, starting this production going through the going through the process Oof, um, I'll share it very, very briefly, um, just because we have other panelists coming on as well. Um, well, first, a little bit content warning. One of the things we dealt with involved like death and could be particularly triggering for some of the listeners. Um, in the beginning of the production, we had a executive producer as part of the project. And um, he really guided us through, through the beginning stage of this and get it off the ground. And um, about, I would say, October of last year, Beatrice and I were actually on a different production at a time. And uh, we got a phone call from a, from a mutual friend and um, said that he actually was missing. So there's a lot of details about this story and a lot of it we honestly don't even know. But basically we, at the end, like the police, you know, did, um, the police did have some conclusion and rooted a um, suicide at the very, at the very end. Um, there's some questioning and circumstance around that, but um, so, you know, we're dealing with this very hard topic and um, 
we are dealing with the the missing and the death of a of a mentor and a friend um as well as you know a, a leader a very important leader of the project so that was uh, definitely a low in the story for us and we had to deal with the grief and deal with you know there was a lot of emotions that come out of it like you know we had like nightmares for like a week so we had to put together at the end and figure out how to move on with our project as well as our like personal life from that that is uh that's one of the things yeah i think because our topic is so personal um it kind of blends the professional filmmaking and personal because it's everyone is contributing through like their personal experiences and passions for this subject so um it was unfortunate um and yeah just like there was between like we're capturing reality and um it also just showed how fragile life is um and the more of the reason to talk about this subject all right um so we do have a trailer ready for you guys and joy if you could reel that up for us it felt like as close to nothing as you can get like the world around me is closing in nothing was still everything was just running all the time. In a lot of Asian cultures, there is no word for mental health issues. I didn't want people to see me that way because that's so different than what I'm usually like. Shame is somehow part of our DNA as Asians. We want to present ourselves in a good manner, in a perfect way. But where it comes from is a place of love and loyalty. He always just seemed like he was always sad. Because I was very much alone um, during my time in the military, and because of that already established stigma of soldiers going to mental health just to get out of their responsibilities, it kind of just made the problem worse. Growing up um, in like the South Asian community and the Caribbean community too, where I'm from, it's like, if you can handle it on your own, it might be better. So I think when the professor in sophomore year was like, what's going on? Like, and it was like a very serious discussion of like, you know, if you miss this, you're gonna get this grade or this mark, or like it's gonna go down. A detective came over to talk to me, but when they asked if I wanted to press charges and like pursue this in court, my mom said that, told me not to. She said that everyone would know about it and that would be worse. Data tell a story. Without data, you don't really know what's going on. There's always the assumption that Asian Americans don't have mental health issues, then they're never included in funding or even in a conversation about mental health in, in this country. Silence is absolutely the most dangerous thing when it comes to mental illness. All of us have problems, all of us are broken. And how we respond to that brokenness is even more important than our own brokenness. These people are there for you. They care about you. So if you choose to ignore that, they don't get the opportunity to be there for you when they really want to be. I believe that everyone needs to find their own voice. Sometimes it may take longer for some than others, but it's really important for you to find that voice. watching um, so for a few things just before we move on um, I wanted to share uh, this this thing uh, we want to thank Janum for offering the resources we first got in contact to provide a event in in person of course there's the quarantine and our circumstances don't allow this and but this is something we still plan to do and we want to have a in-person event where people can come and write and share about things that they've never said um, and so basically this will be an installation that is held in the main space of Janum. And how we plan to go through is to go through five steps or five stages. Uh, the, the main space will be split up into five stages being, the first being, you know, what are some reasons you don't talk about mental health? And um, the second being, what have people said that have made you scared of sharing? Uh, the third being, what do you wish to tell your friends? What do you wish to tell your parents? And finally, tell me something that you have.
you guys have said. And this is something that we would wish to have all of you guys at, and I hope you guys can stay involved and learn more about it as we are released from lockdown and uh, programming starts up again. And um, so the last thing I want to do, this is part of the resource link that Jen has left. Um, our website is uh, www.thingsineversaidfilm.org. And this is a big project and it requires support. And while we have put a lot of time and a lot of people have put in a lot of work for free for this, we do need some funding and we could use as much help as possible. So please visit our page. And if you feel that this is something you wanna get behind, uh, thank you so much for giving your time to do so. Um, and that's it. So thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you so much to the Things I Never Said team. Um, it was such a powerful trailer and I'm really looking forward to seeing the final product. Um, wanna encourage everyone again to take deep breath and that kind of find yourself again in your body. Um, and now I want to introduce our next artist. Um, Asya Ayubi is a Qasida or Islamic poetry reciter and musician currently based in the Midwest. She has done many interfaith and community events and workshops across the United States performing music and in Little Tokyo. As a Muslim of Japanese African American heritage, Asya strives to bridge the gap between her communities. Her belief is that music translates across belief systems and identities, and it has the power to uplift and bring people together from all walks of life. So now I'd like to invite you in. Hi, Salam, Hela, peace everyone. Um, I'd like to quickly thank Joy for reaching out to me um, and the folks at Janum also for providing such a, an amazing platform for community. Um, uh, my time is a little short, so I'm going to kind of just power through some things um, while still, I don't know, I'm, this is my first time doing this, but Here's a link um, to some notes, just some pointers, what I'll be talking about. Um, I wanna talk about first processing emotions and anxieties through music. So I've been a musician for um, 10 plus years and um, through the music that I do, it's, it's very spiritual as is all music, right? We all find solace and, and and music and so um, I'm very open about this but I have bipolar type 1 disorder and um, kind of I've I will go in the, into this more but um, music has always been an outlet and I'm sure most of you can relate um, but I find that when I'm in a, a I guess altered state or uh, not so good, when I'm not feeling so good, music can really lift me out of such a bad place. With bipolar disorder, um, there are cycles. So you go into depression through mania and back to depression usually um, with type one. And I guess a little backstory about it, I struggled a lot with, um, sharing with my family if I was struggling. You know, um, I have a big Asian influence in my family. Uh, my grandmother, Nobuko Miyamoto, she's Japanese American and I'm uh, Gose. And I always felt as the oldest, you know, that feeling where you have to have everything together and you know, like you, you can't break in front of people, you know. That was my uh, mindset for so long is I, I can't break, I can't take a break, you know? And through that, it actually triggered my first episode. And um, I was all over the place. I was living in LA at the time actually, and I was trying to get into schools and working a job like 40 hours a week and doing all these crazy things all over LA. And you know, it's just, Looking back on it, it was insane. 
It really was like, I would be in Hollywood and then go to South Central and just be all over trying to, trying to do too much, you know, to do so much for my family. I think that's what I really was trying to accomplish is I was trying to like make my family proud by staying busy, staying busy, like just doing things, you know? And at the same time as I was trying to build a success, I wasn't asking for help, you know? I was kind of keeping my family in the dark about what I was doing and I was struggling, you know? I was struggling so much as an artist trying to make my mark and trying to reach others with, you know, my, my art form, you know, and during the election, um, I had a breakdown and, you know, this is a, um, trigger warning, you know, sorry if anybody is, um, having some heavy emotions right now, but I'm sure you can relate, you know, during the election, that was a tough time back in 2016. And right after that, I just had a breakdown. I just, everything fell apart for me. And um, I remember my family being there, you know, they were there for me. They, no questions asked, just showed up, visited me in the hospital, and it was, um, it was weird. I just have to say, like, it was a weird experience because mental health wasn't talked about in my family, you know. Even in the African-American community, we don't talk about mental health, you know. If you're depressed, oh, just, just snap out of it, just snap out of it you know, nobody wants to see you cry, right? (laughs) That's what we all think, right? But in reality, we're like, you know, the folks said before me, like, we're all struggling, you know, in the documentary, they talked about struggle, and that's just it. We're all struggling together. You're not alone. I just want to say that. And so um, I don't know how much time I have uh, but, um, I wanted to read a quote, um, hugs, um, before I read the quote, I wanted to talk about affirmations, um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if possible. So you guys can all read along with me. But the one thing that really helped me out um, with my depression because I was severely depressed. I couldn't move. I couldn't get up. I couldn't eat. I couldn't shower. You know, like those, and anyone who has depression knows how hard it is to be a normal human being. But one thing that really helped me was affirmations. And um, so I have this up for folks who are, um, have hearing, hard of hearing or are deaf, but I wanted to talk about the coping and healing experience that reciting positive affirmations hold. We tend to be so hard on ourselves, filling our minds with, I'm not good enough all the time. And I personally find that this leads to roadblocks in my mood, my progress as a life learner, and my ability to feel good in my body and spirit. If I start to feel eaten up by negativity from within, and outside forces like family, work, world calamities, I write down and recite out loud positive affirmations. This was given, this has given me almost miraculous progress in building mental clarity as a person and as an artist. 
So um, I just want everybody to take two deep uh, cleansing breaths and um, repeat after me. I'll be doing a short affirmation. So first breath. In. Out. Number two. In. Out. And shake it out. Just shake it out. So what I want you to repeat after me is, I am strong. I am powerful. I am loved. Through exercises like this, um, I've definitely found relief. And um, I hope you do too. And um, this leads me to this quote by Hazrat Inayat Khan. He's a Sufi musician. And um, Sufism is basically the spiritual practice of a wide uh, belief system. Buddhists have it, uh, Christians, um, also Hindus, Muslims. So he says in this book, um, when a pitch is, nat is a natural pitch of voice and a person sings a note in that pitch, that will be the source of that person's healing as well as that of others. But the person who has found out their keynote of their own voice has the key to their whole life. That person through their own keynote can then help others, paraphrased. And the reason I chose this quote is because um, I remember I had done my first um, therapy session that actually worked. And anyone who um, has been to therapy knows that it's not always great the first time. But um, I remember she had, my counselor had me say some affirmations out loud, just things that I don't believe about myself, right? Just like that I'm a successful person or that I have a good impact on others. I didn't believe that. I really didn't. And um, eventually, um, Eventually, after doing these affirmations with myself, I was able to build up uh, my own belief in myself. You know, it's hard. It's really hard. Um, and so my thoughts on this quote, I also said, the discovery of the self is actually asking yourself, who do you want to be in your everyday life? your life, not for anyone else, not for parents and family, not for peers. This has been a hard act of radical self-love for me to be selfish but mindful while asking the question, who am I? Like, the exercise, like exercising the voice to find our keynote. We must exercise the parts of our identity we want to expand on and discover or leave behind in the process. Um, so that's basically all I had. Um, I um, put my social media and that link I put in the chat if anybody would like to, you know, continue the conversation as, every, as with everyone else. But, um, yeah, um, I just have a song to share, and that's pretty much it. If, um, Joy, you want to play the song for everyone. This is a recording of me um, that I did actually around the time of my first breakdown. And this was the first piece of art that I put together after that. Thank you, Joy, for dropping the 
the um, socials. <laughs> I said just thanks <laughs> um that's all thank you so much and again um i'm always open to conversation um so hit me up thank you so much asia i hope you all are applauding with me at home i took that chance to stand up and say the affirmations um and I am so grateful that you are part of this program. Um, so I want to in, uh, introduce our next performer, um, which is Audrey Kuo, who is a gender queer femme poet, writer, facilitator, and organizer. Their art is an extension of their commitment to transformative justice and collective liberation, centering queer and trans people of color. First, first draft, second chances, their first chapbook, was self-published in July 2012, and their second book, Six Months of April Este, is currently in the prototype phase. Their short play, Every Story is a Love Story, will be staged in May 2020 as part of the Eastside Queer Stories Festival. Audrey currently lives on unceded Tongva territory in Los Angeles. They believe in the liberatory possibilities of gathering to share food and stories, and are interested in reconnecting with Taiwanese and Chinese food histories and land. They also bake very delicious bread. Um, so I want to welcome Audrey. Thanks, Joy. Um, I did not write Very Delicious. Joy added that in, um, just as an FYI. So I'm Audrey. I use they, them. Um, for folks, since there isn't live interpretation, my, I did transcribe all of the poems I'm reading, and they will, Joy will be posting a link to my blog. Um, I will be asking um, for a volunteer to talk about, like, just something that's bumming me out. Um, hopefully not the most um, intense thing that's going on in your life right now. Um, so I'll be doing poetry and then closing with an improv story. So if you feel brave and want to come on camera and share your story, you can volunteer for that in the chat right now. Um, and you would just like do like a two sentence summary of what you're experiencing. I'm gonna ask like two questions um, and then you can go off camera. Or you can stay on live tell your story and everyone can see your face. Um, Cool. So I just wanted to give some quick content notes. Um, my poetry will involve grief, collective grief, um, dysphoria, and then um, I will be talking a little bit about ideation in trans folks, um, suicidal ideation, um, but not go into any graphic details. So please do take care of yourself as needed. Um, and as always, drink water, which I'm glad to is reminding all of us. Um, and then, yeah, I will just start. So I have a friend's borrowed typewriter, so I've been typing pieces, um, which is a really fun way for me to explore poetry in a different form. Um, so April 28th, the things we cherish tell us who we are. Our love tethers us to one another. These are all from Poetry Month this year. April 2nd, in times like these, return to what you know, the memory of breath, 
clean air flowing through you every time you have expanded, unfurled, and grown. The certainty of your own body, how it has loved and carried all of you, how it is all of you, how it is all of you, home for your spirit and all of the wisdom you have gathered. Return to yourself, to the comfort of knowing you are held by love, in love, by the many who have needed you and the ones who came before but had to go. You are never alone, even now, our bodies longing for touch to be carried through. Whatever comes next, let hope be your vessel. May your breath fill your sails. April 4th. Um, sorry, I'm gonna talk about poems. Um, these have been really helpful for me, I think, um, especially in isolation. It's really hard for us to, it may feel harder for us to connect, I think. Um, for sick and disabled queers, there's always been us being able to find community through digital spaces. And I hope that that has been true for some of you who have less experience with staying at home. Um, I also just wanna note that, <clears throat> that I think we talk a lot about how mental health is stigmatized in Asian American communities, not enough. It's just a conversation that's emerging. But I also wanna make sure that we are not creating a false binary between body and mind and the spiritual emotional core of us. I think in addition to the stigmas around mental health, there's huge stigmas in Asian American community and in all of our communities around physical disabilities. And also often these things are overlapping. So when we talk about mental health being an issue, being a stigma, it's actually tied to the structural frameworks of ableism and oppression um, and the intersections of how those actually restrict us from being able to create a society where all bodies are valued. Um, and so as a, sick and disabled queer and trans person, writing these pieces has also been my own spell work and being able to call myself back into my body. Um, a lot of these pieces are about dysphoria, about returning to self, and they feel like little prayers and intentions that I'm typing as I'm writing them to me and to you. Um, April 4th. The beauty of this life is you are writing yourself into existence. You envision yourself in a dream, in a breath, and become. Keep creating, uncovering, honing in, making a body of yourself, creature finding home in skin. You are this wondrous imagining, the unafraid seeking of truth made flesh. You are alive. What could be more beautiful? Uh, so this piece, when we watch Milan, is actually on a different blog post from the other one. Um, and this piece, uh, I've actually had a few trans friends recently lose their parents, and I think there was a piece I've been trying to write called Being Trans at the Funeral about grieving and being with family, and especially with losing a parent, feeling like, how far did they go with you and being able to see us and understand our journeys and a feeling of finality that comes with death, even though time is not linear and it is a construct. Um, I think there's a grief that comes with the grief of um, losing possibilities of being seen in all of the ways that we are as trans and queer people. Um, so this piece is called When We Watch Mulan, and it was for my friend Caden. How we are and are not our fathers, these Chinese men we do and do not know. We will talk about the stories we may never know, cherish the ones we know how to tell, about how we so often talk about our feelings, our manhood, how we dress as who we see, Looking in the mirror, we know these reflections as our true selves, forged and shaped like her father's sword, nurtured and watered like the flowered comb she leaves behind. We strive to fill these footsteps, trace ourselves in the curves of their jaws, the shape of our hair. Out of what do we make our manhood? Dark moon mystery they left behind. We will talk about all of the times we cried looking in the mirror, all of the times we might cry looking in the mirror, that man, staring back at me. Mind or drink water? Okay, I have one more post, uh, piece, poem, post, blog post. Um, and again, a reminder, if you would like to volunteer to talk about something that's bumming you out, uh, please tell Joy, who hopefully is monitoring the chat because I am trying to focus not on that. Okay. Um, Uh, this piece is for Stacey Milburn, um, who passed uh, two nights ago, um, the day before her 
33rd birthday, um, and she's done so much work in the disability justice world and community and is um, a sibling to a lot of my queer trans chosen family. Um, and yeah. May 20th. How much grief can a body hold, a collective, before saturation, before too much of too much? That temptation to let go, tempered only by not wanting to add another name to the litany. I'm sorry, I made edits on this piece. And I'm gonna start over. <clears throat> um, how much grief can a body hold, a collective, before saturation, before too much of too much? That temptation to let go, tempered only by not wanting to add another name to the litany of whispered words. The tender things we called one another become our quiet prayers. A chant, a praise book, a memorial of all of us who dared to live. How much is too much? A desert of our hearts, parched from the shedding of so many tears, the salt water wrung from us even as we gaze upon past joys, see our own smiles captured forever. The flimsy celluloid, pixels arranged in pleasing shape. And they truly tell our stories. Too much, too much, too much of too much, like what they have always said about us. Our brilliant, eccentric, extraneous bodies twisting under fluorescent lights, the audacity. How dare we love one another, let alone our own broken, sinful bodies. It is not them or us, but the grief that will kill us. Swept away at last, after fighting so hard and for so long, our bodies remembering what it feels like to get lost in the tide, that sweet surrender to anything more powerful than the tiny, beautiful dramas of our tired, exhausting lives. The ocean of it, the beyond. Total and dark and deep, how we can pull it over our bodies like a blanket. A blanket, comfortable, heavy, enveloping us into rest, peace at last. Um, and then something that just came to me last night is, um, I just, I know it's hard right now to be trans and non-binary, to spirit folks, gender non-conforming, intersex folks. Some of us may be in homes where we're not seen, um, not being able to access haircuts or be with our community, maybe triggering dysphoria. Um, and so I have a prayer for us and I hope that at least one moment of every day you feel seen. Um, and feeling seen could be seeing yourself in the mirror. Um, but I just want you to know that I see you and I love you and I hope that one day we will get to meet in person and hug, but consensually if you want to. So if there is a volunteer, Joy, can you invite them on camera? Otherwise, if that doesn't happen in the next five seconds, great. Does a panelist want to? I'm going to invite another panelist if they want to come in. It's bringing this on you. <laughs> a panelist volunteer. Asia's down. Great. <laughs> Here we go. I'm going to close myself off again. Then. <laughs> cool. So, in like just two to three sentences, can you tell me something that's just bumming you out or has been difficult in this time? So, ever since I came out, as uh, gender non-conforming and I'm also pansexual, um, it's been a hard time at home for me. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I don't live with my parents right now. <laughs> and um, I visit them and that's enough, you know, I think. Um, but it's like a safety thing, you know, when you, when you're not seen as who you are, it's like you, you're left kind of like unprotected, even with your own family, you know, and I think that's what um, is hurting the most. Cool. Um, and if you were to be played by an animal, what animal would you like that to be? Plagued? Plagued, plagued. If, plagued. if there's a story someone was making up theoretically right now, what animal? It would be a horse. Okay, and would you want that horse to use your name or a different name? A uh, different name. Okay, do you want to make a name? Um, 
Ruby. Ruby, and what are Ruby's pronouns? Uh, they, them. Cool, um, and can you give me a location? Actually, before you uh, do that, everyone else, you have like 30 seconds in the chat, I will take up to 10 random words, and I'll take up to like 15, so <laughs> type them in the chat. Okay, can I get a location? Um, Malibu. Cool, great, and you're welcome to stay on camera if you would like, but you don't have to. Sure, yeah, I'll stay on camera. And I'm just writing down the words. Okay, I'm getting bread. Oh, sorry, I can't. I'm okay. I'm writing down, and then I'll read from my list. Okay, cool. Um, so one of the things that I do for my joy practice is host the children's story time on Fridays, um, because joy and play are. I mean, people named Joy are great. Joy as a concept is also my fave. Um, great. Um, so the part of Ruby is gonna be played by Aurora, the dog. Um, and this is a story. Actually, it's funny, because I was gonna do an improv story, but all of the words and your prompt are actually from a story that I know that's been passed down for many generations in my family about a horse named Ruby. Wow. Um, once upon a time, there was a horse named Ruby. Aurora, are you ready? Aurora gets a little shy, so for those of you in the audience, we know we can't see you, but if you could just clap for Aurora, or maybe do a little howl at home, Aurora would love that. You feel that? You ready? Cool. Okay. So Ruby the horse um, was, you know, a horse among horses, lived with all of the other wild stallions out in the world, got to run in the fields, and had a great time. But they always noticed that something about them seemed a little bit different from the other horses. And so sometimes they would just run to a corner of a pasture while everyone was eating grass and kind of just take some time by themselves. And eventually they realized something that felt different was they wanted to use they them pronouns and they felt non-binary. All the other horses, you know, the girl horses would put bows in their hair and then the boy horses would go and play with trucks. It was very weird. They somehow internalized this from people who they weren't even around, but they just scripted all these things onto their weird horse genders and were very binary. And Ruby was like, you know what? Sometimes I want to sing. Sometimes I want to play with trucks with my hooves. Sometimes I want to put bows on. Sometimes I want to cut my mane real short. I don't need to, you know, fit into all of these different things that people are saying. Like sometimes I love looking at peonies and sometimes I love the color pink and other times, you know, I just want to pretend to be a potato out in the field. And that's not any gender other than what I am. So Ruby, Ruby went back to the family and they were like, family, I have something to tell you as a horse um, and I'm non-binary. And Ruby's mom, really well-respected mayor in the community, actually a mayor mayor, um, a mayor's female horse, a mayor is the leader of a town. They also had um, internalized just citizen structures from people. A lot of things that colonization gave to the horses were just not serving the horse community. So Ruby, Ruby felt like their parents just really couldn't support them. They're like, I'm gonna go to the corner of my pasture, um, just eat some bread. So they went, they ate some bread in the corner of the pasture as they thought about what they needed. And they realized that, you know, there had to be other animals out there who didn't always fit into the gender binary. And as they were thinking that, a hedgehog appeared. And this hedgehog, Farmer Keith, um, I was like, hey, Ruby, I just know your name because I guessed it. Um, you look a little sad, even though we've just met. Can I ask what's wrong? And Farmer Keith and Ruby got to talking about gender and feeling different. And Farmer Keith was like, I have a story for you. One time I was building a cabinet. I was really struggling because the wood was just bouncing all over the place. It was sunrise. The sun was in my eyes. And I asked my family, can you support me with this? And my family was just like, not there for me. They're like, we're hedgehog carpenters. We've always done things these way, this way. You need to just deal with it. So I got on the telephone and I called my best friend. And my best friend helped me to figure out a different way to be. And it really made me feel a lot better. And so if you need a friend right now, I just want to say, I'm here for you. And Ruby, the horse was like, wow, I've never met a hedgehog before. And I've also never met another non-binary person. By the way, your overalls are beautiful. Um, I would love to be friends and to just talk about how we can be non-binary and support each other together. Would you like a hug? And Farmer Keith did want a hug. So they hugged and they became friends 
and Ruby's heart was so full and it jiggled like jello. Um, the end. I, re I realized I didn't read that list of words. That was <laughs> Go ahead. incredible. You are amazing. That was kind of exactly how it went for me. <laughs> I hope your farmers are supportive. Oh my god, the overalls. I have a friend who literally his well, they're saying now. They I didn't realize was they. They wore overalls and I met them at my job. And then we just became friends through that. They were a regular. So same thing. I love you. Thank that was you. great. Thank you, thank and thank you for sharing your music. <laughs> Um, just to wrap, I'm going to read back the list of words. You could probably tell by the weird segues. It was crunch, potato, telephone, bread. Potato is on here twice. Pink, joy, cabinet, sunrise, bounce. I did not say book, jello, and peonies. Um, potato. Thank you all so much. I hope that you feel seen at home and that you're drinking water and taking good care of yourself and that you make space for play. Thank you. Thank you so much, Audrey, for all of those that all of that amazingness. And thank you for the reminders of the ways that mental health and physical health and disability and stigma are also entwined. Um, such an important conversation. And also for the reminder of play as a way of healing and as a way of just being more present and being joyful. <laughs> um, and yes, please drink some water. I would love to introduce our next um, performer, artist, Charlotte Wynn, who is a spiritual and transformational coach who is continuously asking how to live a life of service that can lovingly overturn the status quo. After the death of her first love in 2007, she began a journey to learn how to be free from suffering. Meditation, movement, and activism each played a role, weaving together her love of spiritual practice, social action, and creative expression. In 2017, she became the founder of Get Free, a wellness consultancy and community that helps change makers to become more inspired and emotionally healthy through the transformative power of mindfulness. Since then, she has worked with hundreds of people in the field of personal development, helping them cultivate lives full of trust, confidence, intimacy, connection, mindfulness, and compassion with themselves and all their relations. She is humbled, grateful, and expanded by it all. Um, so Charlotte, I would love to welcome you. Hey. Hi, folks. Can everybody see me and hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, amazing. Thanks, Annie. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for that, Joy, um, and to all the other panelists for helping me go, go deeper. Um, my name is Charlotte, and just really so much gratitude for this moment and this opportunity to share my story and my practice with you all. Um, there's a transcript available of some of the movement instruction that I'll be offering today, as well as just parts of my story. And um, if any of you decide to take video or, I don't know, share about your experience today, I love when y'all tag me in things, so I'm going to just share my my handle here in the chat box. Um, but as Joy mentioned, I am a spiritual and transformational coach as well as a dancer and a movement artist. I'm also the survivor of many things. I don't, I don't look like what I've been through. I think most of us don't, right? Um, I've had PTSD since I was a teenager. I'm a survivor of sexual assault. And um, about three years ago, actually eight days after um, the election, I survived a racially motivated hate crime. And so, you know, in my process of in my journey to find healing from sexual violence and racial violence, it's really um, dance and movement has been such an ally in helping me find joy and, and pleasure in my body, especially after sexual trauma, and has also helped me reclaim my, my sexy, my sensual, and, and my really sovereign embodiment. And my life and practice is hugely inspired by the work of Adrienne Marie Brown, and so I'd love to share with you all, um, what I'd love to share with you all today is, is really dance as pleasure activism. 
And I want to share a quote and an affirmation from her book, Pleasure Activism. Um, Asia talked about affirmations earlier this evening, and so maybe this is one that you can add to your little resilience toolkit. Um, I am a microcosm of all the possible justice, liberation, pleasure, and honesty in the universe, and I act accordingly. So for me, what this quote actually reminds me of and helps me turn my attention to is the fact that pleasure is the point of liberation work. It, it isn't frivolous. It's, it's actually how we take our power back. And I already know and can feel intuitively that there are so many of you here who are just like brilliant organizers and activists and cultural workers and space holders and healers who are very awake to the suffering in the world. And so maybe, you know, at some point during this quarantine, you've asked yourself, like, is there room for pleasure during a crisis? You know, like what, what right do I have? to feel pleasure while others suffer. You know, I know I have. And that's when I get to remember that my greatest responsibility right now is to do whatever I can to stay powerful. I truly believe that your greatest gift to humanity is, is the quality of your inner world and recognizing that feeling good makes you powerful means that pleasure um, really is the key to unlocking your higher potential. And when there are systems of violence that are here to harm us, right, to get rid of us, when we're empowered, we actually frustrate that system. Does that make sense? So I just want to guide all of us today in kind of like a sensual embodiment practice. Um, it's a very, very gentle um, gender neutral practice to just invite some pleasure into our bodies to like romance ourselves and open up our our um, receptivity to pleasure especially on days where that just feels you know too far away for us sometimes right um so i just want to just preface by saying remember that no one is watching you our cameras are off it's just you and your body today um my friend jasmine who's also a dance teacher says um, internal sensation over external appearance. So please remember that everything I share and I say is just an invitation. Um, please listen, listen to your body, listen to your intuition. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my, my audio with you all. Just give me one moment here. Um, And please, at any point, if you have difficulty hearing me over the music, just please, you know, flag it in the chat room so I know. Okay. Okay. Y'all hear the music okay? Can you hear my voice okay? let me know okay <laughs> all right so let's go ahead and find ourselves me. and Can you focus on let's just find a place that feels safe that feels sexy and sacred and today we're going to start on the floor if that's accessible to you if not you can do this on your bed or on a couch just a nice somewhat flat surface and I'm gonna have you seat your booty nice and slow on your feet. Or if that's hard on your knees, legs crossed, that's fine too. But just closing your eyes, getting grounded, getting focused, sitting in your grace, sitting in your power, letting the body relax, feeling any feeling. Finding your breath, slow it down, nice and slow. Finding your breath. And releasing through the mouth, ah, oh, making the noises. <laughs> and now breathing through your solar plexus or your root chakra, your groin. So finding your breath deep in your pelvic bowl here. Letting it move through the belly, through your heart, all the way to the top of your crown. Hold it there. 
and then release. Oh, letting go completely. Oh, and just taking this time to set any intention, any of your sensual intentions, taking this moment for yourself. And sharing it with me, with us, with each other. Romancing each other. And when you're ready, just allow the body, if you can, to go into a child's pose. Now, if the floor is not accessible to you, you can maybe just do a little back bend, a back fold uh, while sitting on a chair. But if you're able to go into a child's pose, let's just let the head rest. Relaxing, letting everything go. Letting your hips be heavy. And when you're ready, nice and slow, we're gonna bring the body up vertebrae by vertebrae, squeezing the groin, rooting the spine. And we're gonna take the hips around whenever you're ready. Just opening the hips here, any stagnant energy here. Get the body flowing in the hips. Nice. Yes. Maybe preparing for some, I don't know, yummy orgasms letter. Who knows? <laughs> Gotta get it ready, y'all. <laughs> so just keep going. Maybe play with the levels here. So taking it up. And taking it down, inhaling on the up, and exhaling on the down. Beautiful, beautiful. Look at yourself, look how sexy you are. <laughs> and now nice and slow, I'm gonna have you move into a table top position. So just a flat spine here. And when you're ready, closing your eyes, begin to move the body in circles. Move the body in circles. We're rolling the body out nice and slow. We use our lower backs a lot. So just rolling this area out, keeping that breath, squeezing on the up and releasing on the down. A nice pelvic muscle workout to help us feel open, confident. Squeeze all that confidence. Yes, I'll keep going. Maybe add the shoulders to it. Maybe add the chest, add the heart. Take a deep breath, let it go. Opening your neck, source of your communication, yes, and expression, igniting that, igniting that sensuality, passion, desire, manifesting all your desires. Beautiful. And when you're ready, coming to our back. yourself rooted onto the earth here. So whenever I feel overwhelmed or stuck, I just find the earth. Feeling firm, grounded, protected by the earth. Finding the breath, nice and slow. Whenever you're ready, very slowly taking the hands, and you can do as much or as little as you'd like here. You really listen to the body. When we bring our hands to the body, we start to embrace and touch. Again, you can do as much or as little as you'd like. Maybe you touch your legs. Maybe you touch arms, 
maybe your face, your hair. Maybe you just hold yourself and just hang out here. Maybe you just give yourself a hug. You're touching yourself in all the ways that you want to be touched. Taking yourself as your lover today. Everything about you is perfect. Every cell, every fiber. <sighs> and when you're ready, coming into stillness in five, four, three, two, and one. Whenever you're ready, turning to your left or right side, doesn't matter. Very slowly bringing yourself back up to seated position. You can stay here if you'd like, or if you want, you can come up to standing. Beautiful, and we're just gonna invite some free movement here. Okay, so don't stop, just move your body in all the ways it wants to. Flowing like water here, connecting to water, flowing, connecting to the body emotionally. Just letting those emotions flow through your body. Acknowledging and letting it go. I have the willingness, the ability to heal. I the ability to heal emotionally. I have the ability to let go of any story that does not serve my fullest expression. Touching and loving here. And in the dark, I might break your heart. Can get you happy. Claiming our power, claiming our bodies alone, and our you stories. Wanna take you home. So that I'm here, don't plan on touch, love, and coming into stillness, nice and slow. And ten. Really let yourself go here. Again, no one is watching. It's just you and your body. No one is judging you here. Move in all the ways you want to move. Five, four, three, two, and one. Finding your breath and letting go. Beautiful, everybody. Beautiful work. <laughs> um, amazing. Thank you all for moving and just reclaiming your pleasure with me. Let's just take one last breath together. Joining in the intention of a reclamation of our voices, our bodies, our sexualities, our rights our stories. Mm. Thanks everybody, you all did amazing. <laughs> Yay, um, just one last thing. I'm including a link to a free guided meditation. Actually, I forget, the link is not working for some reason right now. So I, I have a guided meditation to support you all in just coping with any difficult emotions or sensations during quarantine using mindfulness, affirmation, loving kindness. Um, and so if you'd um, like that in your inbox, go ahead and just send me your email address in the um, uh, privately to me in the chat, or if you're comfortable just sharing your email in the chat, you can just go ahead and do that and I'll send it. Um, yeah, you'll get it in your email. Just a little gift for me to you. And yeah, I would love to hear your shares or just see your essential dance practice if you feel inspired to, if you feel the call. So yeah, feel free to add me on Instagram, tag me, email me. Um, I'm, I'm here for you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Mwah. <laughs> Much. Thank you. Um, I hope you all were able to move some uh, and get to kind of feel more in your body. And we're going to introduce the last performer. Um, and then we will conclude after that at about 730.
Um, so I want to introduce you all to Priska, who is a Taiwanese American singer songwriter from Los Angeles, California, who, despite her small stature, will draw you in with her big voice and intimate lyrics. Though she spent most of her adolescent years being bullied in school, she was able to find solace and comfort in music and found that her strength lay in her ability to express herself through song. Priska has performed and competed in various international showcases and singing competitions. Judges and fans have been drawn in by her powerful chords and soulful delivery. A lifelong lover of feeling out, of, out songs with her heart, Priska will take you on an emotional journey that involves heartache, loss, and learning to carve your own path. And so with that, I would love to invite Priska. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. <clears throat> I'm so excited. I've been away from LA. Oh no, uh, I hope my internet's okay, guys. You know, we live a, a digital life. Am I frozen? Okay, cool. <clears throat> All right, all right. I'm just gonna keep going because it sounds like everything's still going. Um, but yeah, I've been away from LA for about a year and a half. And uh, right before this, my husband and I, we were in, um, we were in New York. And uh, he was in a little play called Cambodian Rock Band. And so we were out there um, just trying to make a life out of New York. And all of a sudden, I think it was March 12th, whenever the NBA kind of shut down and, uh, we had to hop on a plane, the, the show got closed down, I quit my job and we flew back to LA. So it's been pretty intense. Uh, I don't know what kind of things you've had to miss out on. I'm sure there's a lot of things, um, birthdays, weddings, celebrations, um, but we're going through a lot right now. We're going through a lot. And so um, I think, I think a lot of us might be tempted to be as productive and as busy and as back to normal as we can. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to share a little bit of what I've been through the past year. Um, so again, with Cambodian Rock Band, my husband and I, we like literally quit everything in LA to move and follow this play up to Ashland, Oregon. Who's been to Ashland? Okay, yeah, nobody goes to Ashland unless you're driving to Seattle because it's like on the way off the five. Um, but we got to Ashland and I think, you know, where I was at the time, I was like, let me, oh, you've been to Ashland? Hey, <laughs> what's up, Will? Um, so where I was at the time was I was like, I'm not gonna, get, gonna let this sleepy small town win. I'm gonna bring my productivity and my busyness and I'm just gonna get there and I'm gonna kill it. I'm gonna write 20 albums and like, you know, a musical or whatever. But what was, you know, sobering was when I moved up there and it was great and everything was nice and it was beautiful and I'm learning all these things. <clears throat> but when I got up there, I suddenly found myself unable to get off the couch. And I would lay there for days, weeks on end. <clears throat> and uh, about a month into being in Ashland, my, my grandmother passed away. And it was so intense to be in a place where you had to just sit and experience your grief because all the people that I've lost prior to that I had three days of bereavement and then boom back to work but this was open space for grief and I kept wanting to climb out of it and distract myself from it um, and I couldn't and uh, what I ended up doing is just allowing myself days or weeks where it was okay to stay on the couch and all my dreams of hyper productivity went away and instead it was the desire to, to process all the things that I've been through and work on the things in myself that really were put to the side. And so I was given the blessing of time and space. And so all I wanted to say with that is, you know, obviously this pandemic is not a gift, but the time that we've been given, the space we've been given to slow down, to be still, um, that is a gift. And I would just encourage you, don't try and 
make things like normal. The, the normal's out the frickin' window. Normal's done. Um, but just allow yourself to realize, like, right now, this is a traumatic moment. Like, we are undergoing trauma, and your brain chemistry and your body chemistry changes when you're undergoing trauma. It's like fight or flight type of thing, you know? And so just give yourself space, and it's okay. It's okay if you don't do anything today, because those create, creative energies and whatnot will percolate and come back when it's right. But all you can really do is exist in where you're at with your trauma. So yeah. Um, I'm going to play a couple of songs for you guys. Uh, I know we're running a little short on time, but uh, this is one of the songs that I wrote when, when I was up in Ashland. And it is one of those things where I had been trying for weeks to write. And I was so frustrated with myself, you know, I was mad at myself because I'm a good Asian student. Usually if I try for something, I, I get it, you know. Um, but all of a sudden, one morning I was making coffee and breakfast and I heard this song in the back of my head and I ran over to my keyboard and it just poured out of me. And that's one of those humbling moments when you're like, sometimes things are gifted to you. And as good of a songwriter as you want to be or you can learn to be, some things come beyond your control. So this is called Chasm. was you Sorry, the sunset's happening. I'm going to close the blind really quick. B, well, uh, yes. Um, you know, sometimes you can't plan for all the nature. So uh, we'll, get this, we'll get this out of the way. Um, I have two more songs for you guys, if that's okay with you. Thank you guys so much. You guys are so, so, so sweet. I've got my lovely husband over here, Abraham Kim. Shout out to Abraham Kim. He's making all the sound sound good. And uh, he's closing the blind for me as we speak. He's, he's pretty amazing. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm Priska. It's so cool to hang out with you guys. I mean, I feel like I'm outside 
Janum, like standing under the stars, hanging out with you guys, smelling beer in the air. I feel like there's some like beer vendor. Uh, but yeah, I can't wait till we can all be together again. This one's called Sunbeams. I knew a girl who ruled in black and white. The good and bad were always in her sight. And days would pass with sun so very bright. Till one day the princess reign was no more. They run and run and run until they cannot see you. They run and run and run so no one knows your name. And I will hold your secrets to my grave. And I will be the one to take your place. Mm. was light but now is only dark there once was peace but now is only war and time has moved and spun in all directions till one day the princess reign was no more and run and run and run until they cannot see you they run and run and run so no one knows your name. And I will hold your secrets to my grave. And I will be the one to take your place. to my grave and I will be the one to take your place thank you guys um I don't know if we have time but I have one more last song is that okay with everyone okay fantastic um I want to share one last song with you guys you know sometimes I wish I wrote happier songs but I think sometimes with your art you use it to manage and process all the dark things in your life. So lots of people kind of tell me, they're like, ah, oh, we would have had you play at our wedding, but all your songs are too sad. So, but you know, for all the sad song and sad poem writers out there, I say, just keep doing what you do because that's what allows me to be like a happy, sparkling person IRL. You know what I'm saying? Cause I process it. Um, but yeah, this is my last song. My name's Prisca. Thanks everyone um, for just putting together this incredible evening. Uh, Joy, you are a boss and I appreciate you to no end. So thanks for bringing us all together to talk about mental health um, and just to spend time and congregate, even in this weird format. It, it's, I still feel you. Um, like Charlotte said, I can just like feel the intuition out there. So thanks for joining us. This is Rescue Me. I wrote this when I was 16 and uh, 
for anyone out there who's, uh, you know, under 20, 21, I would just encourage you to keep writing because uh, your feelings are so intense. Like, I feel like as an adult, so much of that has been dulled. But, you know, when you're younger, you're just so clear in just what you feel and not what you're supposed to feel. So we're standing here Watching this old ship sink slowly To this dark ocean And I feel just like I've been thrown overboard And I never got to ask why so you swept the hair out of my face and you saw the tears streaming down. Well, even though it's over and done with, well, I guess I still want you around. So please come rescue me. I'm a breaking apart. And I'm sinking it as slowly, slowly. So please come rescue me. I'm a breaking apart, and I'm sinking it as slowly. What about all those times that you whispered to me I loved you softly on the evening air? Well, I guess I believed you, and I didn't think you were the lying, thieving kind of girl. So please come rescue me. I'm a breaking apart, and I'm sinking in a slowly, slowly. So please come rescue me. You've ripped a hole in my soul and I'm sinking in a slowly. From a distance and you're smiling with another though my anchor said in this safe new harbor I still miss sailing the seas with you so please come rescue me I'm a breaking apart and I'm sinking it a slowly slowly so please Come rescue me You ripped a hole in my soul And I'm sinking it a slowly Thank you guys so much. Thanks for putting up with me. <laughs>
thank you so much. Yes, to everyone who came. Um, if you did enjoy what you saw, please consider donating to Janum and supporting us in this time, as well as becoming a member potentially and being able to access more programs like this. Um, really, really grateful to everyone. And um, I guess to conclude our way out, since we're at time, if everyone just wants to share one word for how they're feeling to close this out tonight, feel free also to share in the, uh, the chat as well to everyone who's watching. Um, my word, I think, is hopeful. Um, and I'll pass it off to uh, Beatrice. Do you want to go? Um, I'll say um, calm. <laughs> uh, Cortland? Uh, there's so many words. Um, <laughs> inspired. Charlotte? Uh, you're muted. <laughs> I feel connected. Um, Wendy? You can also pass if people don't want to go. <laughs> um, happy. Audrey? Potato. <laughs> Asia? Horsey. <laughs> Sam? Thankful. And then Priska? Loved. Mm. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, again, this recording will be available with uh, captions online within the next week. So keep an eye out for that on the Janum YouTube page. We'll be emailing out resources. And thank you so much. That's the end of our program. We appreciate you all joining us today. See you.